Um, again, my name is Mark Scorsone. I'm the USM Assistant Director under Joe Jansen. He might be joining us tonight. Um, uh, we have Debbie Maurer over there, MacBook user. Um, she goes by virtual reality game names over there. Uh, she's my assistant. She helps out with wings, saturate uh, any events that we put on. And uh, Luke is our tech guy. Um, he, he makes things run here with all the emails and reminders and stuff like that. And you guys are the ones that are doing it, ministering to a generation in unprecedented times. History will remember us. That sounds like a war movie right there, but um, really proud of you guys and what you're doing. Uh, there's Joe Jansen. He's there with us tonight. Uh, Joe, say a quick hi ho to everybody. hi ho How's everybody great. doing? Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm really glad you're here. Uh, should be a good meeting. We had a good, a good time last week, and I uh, really hope that you get uh, something out of the connections that we're making. I was just on. I was just online with a bunch of people all, all across the U.S. And you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, some people say, "Hey, this is a time for uh, we get the gift of time." And it's a one person says it's a sabbatical. The guys down in New York City, they said this is a war. I mean, they literally have people on ventilators. People are dying. One of our guys lives ten minutes from Elmhurst Hospital, the one that's in the news all the time. Um, but everybody's praying. Uh, but this is the real deal. You know, we're in the middle of something that's pretty, that's, uh, we've never seen before. It's intense. Yes. But, uh, we know that, uh, with, with prayer, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make it through and, uh, some good things are happening. I love the way all of us old guys are embracing technology. We're actually, you know, we're actually not uh, learning how to do some of this stuff. And that's a good thing because it's going to uh, extend the kingdom, uh, well beyond this whole thing that we're going through. So good to see everybody. Uh, appreciate uh, the time, Mark. Appreciate what you're doing, Mark. This is awesome stuff. Thanks. That's a good group. Yeah, Joe, I was just bragging on these guys and how proud of them that none of them had the virtual backgrounds going up like a lot of our area rep guys did today. So, uh, well, they're all, we're all guys. We think it's, you know, it's easy and it's cool. Yeah, we're, they agreed. <laughs> so, um, um, I'm just going to shout out a name and then you guys just introduce yourself real quick and uh, again where you're at and uh, then we'll get going with Alex here in a few minutes. Uh, Sharice. Hey. Um, hey um, how you doing Mark? Um, I am Sharice Paris. I am the youth, uh, youth director at uh, Joy Community Church. It's in Rochester, New York and um, happy to be here. Thanks, Sharice. Brian, we'll bounce over to you. Hey guys, I'm Brian Boswell. I'm the uh, actual senior pastor at Cornerstone Church in Clayton, North Carolina. I'm setting in, I'm a small church, so we gotta do it all here. Youth, children, the whole nine yards. Yeah, I love Clayton there with uh, Pastor Steve down there back in the day. So thanks, Brian, for joining us. Marie. Kay Marie. Yes, uh, my name is Kay Marie Tejeda, and I am in Boston right now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, right now I'm a graduate student. That's not a box Boston accent, though. No, I'm from New York. Like, yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. But I was born in the Dominican Republic, so I've been like. Wow! Well, well, thanks for joining, Mel. Hello, I'm Melody, and I'm from Bristol, Connecticut. A worship pastor and one of the youth leaders at our church in Woolkit, Connecticut. Thanks, Mel. Love having you. Millie from New York. Hi, I'm Millie. Um, go to Lifehouse Community Church here in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I lead the kids ministry, but also help my husband out with the youth ministry. Awesome. Awesome. Michael. Hi, Michael. Um, I am up in Rochester, New York. Um, I serve at a church called City Hope, Roch Wesleyan Church, up in Gates, New York. Um, that answered all. You still work at Delta Sonic? Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm a lay leader right now. So I, I, I this is, I, I'm a youth director, excuse me. I don't dare say youth pastor, I, or I get stoned. Uh, you, you, you're, you are, you are. Bill! <laughs> Hello, I am Bill. I am self-employed electrician in Connecticut, and I work with Mel with the youth at our church. Awesome. 
and I hack up worship sometimes. <laughs> I love how Mel put MJ for her initials. That's not by mistake. Yeah, Michael Jordan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it must be Brent Ben's brother there. Is that Kyrell? How do you say that, bro? From, yeah, from you. Uh, it's Kyrell, and uh, nice. I'm, I'm actually Oleg's brother. Oleg, uh, that's right. Yeah, uh, Ben's my cousin, um, and uh, I am involved in the teen uh, ministry in Calvary Gospel Church in Utica, uh, Newark Mills, actually, New York. So it's great to have you. Great nice, to have you. Nice to see you guys all here. Nick. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm Nick. I'm the youth director at Reach Out Church in Hyde Park, New York. Good to have you, Nick. Beard's getting longer, bro. Yeah, I have got to trim it. I was going to do it tonight, and then I remembered I had this. So. Yeah, no, no, one, <laughs> no one's shaving. Nobody's shaving. <laughs> Glenda. We got Glenda's iPhone, but we don't have a face. Are you there, Glenda? Oh, must be from New York City. You're muted, Glenda. You're still muted. There you go. Okay. Hi, I'm at work. Oh, wow. What a blessing. Where's work? I work at uh, a Brookdale facility with Alzheimer's and dementia residents. Oh, wow. New York. God bless you. God bless you. Thanks for joining. Real blessing. Real blessing there. Hey, Jill, say hi to ho. Hi, I'm Jill. I'm the kids director at Joy Community in Rochester. Awesome. Awesome. Mr. Ortiz. Hi. How are you guys doing? Um, name is Jesus. I'm from uh, the Bronx, New York. Uh, I'm the youth director at Life Together Fellowship. Where else can you be on a Zoom call with Jesus? I just want to say that we're here right now with Jesus. So, <laughs> so um, welcome everybody. So glad that you can be here. Thanks for all that you're doing. Um, again, this is unprecedented times that we're in. I hope um, uh, if you weren't with us last week, uh, I just want this to be a time of encouragement, connection, where we can pray for one another, uh, stand with one another, and also be encouraged by the word. Uh, last week we had David Ham. He wanted to join us tonight, but he's on... Um, Another Zoom call tonight, he said, so he couldn't make it, but he's going to try to make future ones. But uh, it was great hearing from him last week. But this week, we have our Globals Ministry Director, Alex Seidler, who really needs no introduction. He just needs a lot of prayer. But I'm just glad that he's here with us. Uh, just great working with this guy. He's a visionary person. Uh, always got uh, God thoughts uh, going on. And I'm um, just excited. We talked a little bit about the, the word that the Lord put on his heart for um, when I first was trying to put this thing together. I, I reached out to him and he says, man, I got, I got a word right now for, for this group. So it's been two weeks brewing in his heart, probably a lot longer, but uh, you get to hear it fresh. Um, again, kind of the format is that you guys are all Zoom pros, so everybody's muted themselves. Uh, but when you want to say something, go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, the chat group is open. Uh, put down a thought, a question. We want to have a lot of interaction. We're going to have a roundtable kind of discussion. Alex has some um, questions he's going to leave us with that we're going to um, get into after he's done talking. And then at the end, I want you to write down some uh, a question or two on what you want to talk about in the future uh, Zoom huddles that we have, something that you really would like us to address or like to address as a group, uh, go ahead and put those down there anytime you want and we'll uh, compile them. Uh, and then Debbie has some information for us on a couple things that are coming up that she's going to be sharing with us later as well. So Alex, I just want to give you the floor. So uh, glad that you're here with us. So go ahead, share your heart, brother. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. Um, I do tend to yell a little bit, so I'm sorry. Like, I'm looking at Cairo right now. Bro, if those things are turned up, you're toast, man. So <laughs> you might want to lower it a little bit because my wife's downstairs. I can get to yelling. Okay, so, um, but no, I want to thank Mark and actually Joe Jansen. Um, I think this, this thing that we're in right now, I oversee missionaries and the work of BLM around the world. So I'm dealing with that on one front, but really uh, the battle is really on the home front right now in a major way. So I want to give props to Joe Jansen, our U.S. Ministries Director, and Mark Scorsone 
um, for the work that they're doing and allowing moments like this. Um, I was on a call today, with all of our missionaries in Africa, and uh, one of them said, you know what? This is an older missionary. She said, you know what? We've had these avenues for connection for many, many years. It's not like Zoom was invented two weeks ago. It's not like, you know what I'm saying? Like we've had so much avenue of connection. Finally, the world is being connected. And I almost fell out of my chair. And I think that's what's happening. I don't, I'm not, in, I'm not in the uh, theology that God's sending this virus. I don't, I think it's demonic. I think it's insane. I think the enemy wants to take us out, but I think God is using it and turning it completely on its head and using it to further the kingdom and bringing us together in a fresh way. I've talked to a lot of the missionaries I lead have been on the mission field as long as I've been alive. I'm a ripe 34 and they've been on the field longer than that. And they've said they've never seen, these are, these are missionaries in their seventies. They've never seen a more chaotic event on a global scale and a more triumphant moment for the global church coming together. So I'm coming to you tonight. I'm coming to you tonight, friends, full of faith, full of compassion for our brothers and sisters in New York City and uh, family members uh, that are being affected by this, other areas of the country. But I'm trusting and believing that God is going to come through in a fresh way. And so the word that I have in my heart for you tonight is um, really looking at discipleship in a remote, uh, like a remote, a forced remote season. So right now, I know you would love to have all your youth group kids come together so you could strangle them and tell them to do their homework. I'm sure that you would love to do a worship session just to like get the presence of Jesus on them. But we can't right now. We have to, we can't actually meet together. And so I want to actually talk through what I think is really important to understand as leaders. But I want to talk through something that's called pre versus post Pentecost discipleship. Now, if you're a Christian and you have a Bible, you know, Acts 2 is almost like a line in the sand because in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit meets the believers in the upper rooms. And what happens? Heaven happens. Very good, Cairo. I heard that. He like the Holy Spirit falls, tongues of fire on their heads. They go out in the streets. Everyone thinks they're drunk. It's only 9 a.m. It sounds a lot like Lima, New York, but it's not. And the, but then all of a sudden they start, let's start listening to them. And what they realize is that the, these people that seem like they're drunk are speaking in tongues and they're actually speaking in their native language and they're preaching and proclaiming the gospel. So to me, Acts 2 is a major moment of pre-Pentecost before Acts 2 and then post-Pentecost after Acts 2. And honestly, if you would study that in detail, how did Jesus uh, disciple his disciples versus how did Jesus's disciples make disciples? It's completely, completely different. They're teaching the same principles, but how they go about is completely different. Like Jesus's model for discipleship, the disciples were completely dependent on the person of Jesus. All you have to do is read through the New Testament and you'll see that Every time Jesus leaves his disciples in a physical sense, all right, guys, I'm going to go pray. You stay here and don't fall asleep. Five seconds, they're knocked out. Five seconds, they're out. Like Jesus leaves the room to go to the, use the restroom, and all of the disciples are arguing about who's greater and who's number one. You know, it's like, it's like hilarious how the disciples do not have it together when Jesus is not there. And then when Jesus comes back, they're all good. So Jesus realizing, wait a second. If I'm going to leave, you knuckleheads are in trouble because you guys are so dependent on my physical presence for you not to go crazy. Now I want to bring it close to home. As pastors and as leaders, as youth pastors, as a, I was a missionary for 12 years, making disciples, planning churches, doing stuff overseas, like what we can fall into the same trap of a pre-Pentecost method and usage, which is my youth group kids only do well when mama or papa is around. If I'm not around, everything hits the fan. But Jesus introduces something that's a total game changer in discipleship. And what I think this moment is doing for us as pastors, as leaders, as Mike, Michael Ronenberg, a youth director, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to judge anybody. What, what the Lord is doing is he's allowing our students, check this out, not to become dependent on us, but us helping them become dependent on him. Nod if you're with me right now. Don't unmute, but nod. 
I need to see some head nodding. Okay. Jesus said this in uh, John uh, 14, 6. I, I, t I teach this. I, I've, done, uh, I've done teachings with uh, Southern Baptist people and some other denominations that aren't in that Pentecostal charismaniac stream like I am and we are. And I always tell them, Jesus loves the Holy Spirit more than you ever could. So let's look at what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this in John 14, 6, but the helper, capital H, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, check this out, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. How could Jesus ever leave to go to the right hand of the Father to prepare a place for us if he couldn't even leave for five minutes without the disciples imploding? Here was the solution. I'm going to train you, my disciples, you 12 knuckleheads, one of you is going to betray me, but I'm going to train you to understand the principle of I'm sending a helper. In fact, in a couple chapters later, after John 14, Jesus says this, and this blows my mind. It's to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, the helper won't come. Now, imagine, yo, yo, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. You know when Jesus goes to the restroom, Peter tries to take off your head. You know that when Jesus goes to the restroom, Judas starts scrounging, trying to collect some money. Matthew, Levi, starts trying to collect some taxes from the disciples. Like everything hits the fan when Jesus leaves. Now Jesus says, hey, you know what? It's actually better that I go because if I don't go, the helper can't come. And remember, the helper is invisible. So you can't see him. Like you so imagine the disciples' state of mind going, Jesus, if you leave, everything will self-destruct. All of this will start to go downhill. But then the disciples wait in the upper room. Acts 2 happens. They're filled with fire. They're filled with the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. And what's awesome is, like, if you just look at the life of Peter, before Peter is baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, y'all know this, you preach on this, Peter is, like, denying that he knows Jesus to a teenage girl. He's violently lashing out. Jesus has to tell him, get thee behind me, Satan. He's being accused of being satanic. He, he is totally out of control. Now the Holy Spirit comes. He gets full of the Holy Spirit, full of fire, full of faith, full of hope. And what happens? After he's filled in Acts 2, later in that chapter, he's preaching to thousands of people, proclaiming the gospel in a fantastic way. And if you talk to missiologists and Bible scholars and people that have studied scripture, if you look at that sermon at the end of Acts 2 that Peter preaches, they say that is the textbook sermon that is perfect theology of what the gospel is. So here's a guy who's cowering, who, who is, is angry, who is lashing out. He's dependent on Jesus being there in a physical sense. But now Jesus says, I'm sending you my helper. So that way you have someone 24-7, 365 to be with you. And what we see is a, a absolutely amazing leader, an amazing preacher, and someone who is not scared anymore. Where he was scared of a teenager, now he's scared, now he's not scared of anything. In fact, in, in Acts chapter four, two, two chapters later, Peter and John get arrested and they're standing in front of the Sanhedrin where Peter would have been peeing his pants. He would have to put on some depends. He'd have to you know, change his tunic because he was doing that with a teenage girl knowing Jesus. Now he's standing in front of the main leaders of that day, and he's saying, they're telling him, stop preaching the gospel. He's telling them, we can't help but preach. We will preach. I don't care what you do to me. I don't care what you do to us. We are going to go. If you release us, we're going back out to preach the gospel. If you throw me in jail, guess what? I'm going to preach the gospel in there. What happened to Peter? He didn't eat his Wheaties that day. Uh, maybe he listened to the Joel Osteen podcast. I don't know. I do that. That pumps me up. Yeah. Um, maybe he maybe he prayed and fasted for years. No, I'll tell you what happened. Is that Peter finally entered into the, the post-Pentecost discipleship that was all in Jesus' plan from the beginning. And friends, we have a great opportunity right now with your students right now. I, I guarantee, Mark, if we were going to go around and share, we could share about the concerns that we have for our kids. We could share about the concerns that we have for these students. But I want to challenge you in a fresh way as youth leaders to embrace uh, a, a, a mentality 
and a relationship and a partnership with the Holy Spirit to train and disciple and encourage and to fill and to lead your students. And what happens is this, what happens is when you enter into this new style of discipleship, which we're kind of being forced into, Right now, we don't have an option. We have to use Zoom. We have to do FaceTime. We have to do, if you don't, you got to use Marco Polo to talk to the kids. You, you, we, we're using this stuff. But we, we are being forced into a new partnership with the Holy Spirit because we are physically not able to be present on a weekly, consistent basis. So really, when I look at my ministry over the past uh, 10 plus years, the moments where I had high control because I had fear of the outcome, I limited the Holy Spirit. Yep. The moments that I wanted to uh, make sure this happened or make sure that student didn't make that decision or make the, my, my high control is always because of high fear. And so friends, the, the challenge for us tonight is not, no, I'm not even saying like, hey, how do we make disciples? And I'm not even asking practical stuff. We could do that another time. What I'm asking you tonight is how much are you trusting the Holy Spirit with your students, your ministry, your future? What do these next months look like? What are you doing during the summer? What does the fall look like? I want to ask you and kind of just, just put the thermometer in. How is your trusting the Holy Spirit going? Yeah. Because what happens is when you, when you partner with the Holy Spirit in a fresh way, you have to understand you just made a partnership with the greatest discipler of all mankind. Like you're coming now into greater cahoots with the person that knows more about your students than you ever will. In fact, check this out in first John two twenty seven. it says, as for you, the anointing, which you have received from him abides in you. Now check this. And you have no need for anyone to teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it taught, has taught you, you abide in him. When you come into a fresh partnership, when you just search your heart and say, okay, God, am I, am I freaking out? And it, it's okay to have fear. We don't want to be fearful. But to have a sense of like concern for your students is totally normal. But right then in that moment, you got to check in and say, okay, but, but God, can I trust you in a fresh way? I want to partner with you. God, can my students grow more in the next three months of us not physically meeting than if we were physically meeting? See, that's a big question that you need to trust the Holy Spirit on. Everything in your brain would say, oh, there's no way. Let's just make it through these next two to three months. I want to challenge you right now. Don't make peace with that. As you trust the Holy Spirit, as you lean in to the great discipler, as you press into him and seek him and ask him for wisdom and encourage your students to go after God in a fresh way, you're going to see them radically grow and radically changed. The more of the discipleship process that I carry, the less that the Holy Spirit carries. Yeah, I'm about yeah. to take an off remark. I, I feel I'm ready. I don't think I'm going to get a lot of money, but I'm <laughs> I'll give you my stimulus check when it comes in. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Hey, you uh, got a lot of kids. That's going to be good money, bro. <laughs> that's already I'll gone. never forget. It was, it was 2007. I think that's when Michael Rottenberg was born, <laughs> but um, it was 2007 and I was, I was living in East Asia and we were sharing the gospel. We were planning churches on these college campuses. These kids, we would say like my brother down here named Jesus we would go on college campuses and say, hey, have you heard about Jesus? They would think that's my friend from the States. Like they would have no, they had no, now I can say, yeah, my friend is going to preach the gospel. They would have no clue who Jesus is and what's going on. But I'll never forget in 2007, I had a friend named Lee Chung and Lee Chung got radically saved. And Lee Chung was like me back when I was not following the Lord. He was a drinker. He was a smoker. He was a partier. He, he was my kind of guy. I understood his reference of where he was at in life. When he got radically saved, I made sure, I was trying to apply this principle. I made sure I didn't tell Orange. Now, Orange, now that you're saved, no more smoking, no more drinking. Stop it. Because here's the deal. If Orange would have done that, who, he, who would he have been obeying? He would have been obeying Alex. And then everything in his life for every decision would be, Alex, can I date this girl? So what I was trying to do is 
and I'm 21 years old, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to prepare and live this out. So I'm saying, how can I help orange build a fresh relationship and a fresh, like he's just saved a fresh, like moment with the greatest discipler that will never leave him, never forsake him. I, I haven't seen orange probably in 10 years, but guess what? The Holy Spirit's been with him every single moment. The day after he got saved, he used to smoke a pack of cigarettes every single day. The day, the day after he got saved, he sent me a text. And he said, Alex, do you think I should stop smoking? And I said, why do you think that? He says, does God want me to stop? And I said, ask him and see what he says. He's been saved for one day. He says he pulls up in his car. He was a little bit older than I was. He pulls up in his car in front of the same shop that he bought a pack of cigarettes from every single day. He pulls up in front. He gets out of his car. He looks up to the sky because that's where God lives. He looks up and he says, God, what should I do? And he says he heard a still small voice speak to him and say, get back in the car, shut the door and never smoke again. And he did it. And from that time, Orange got plugged into the church. Orange started bringing his friends. Orange saw God use him in a powerful way. But that's that's what that that's that's the that's the potential when we enter into a relationship in a fresh way, partnering with the Holy Spirit. How do we actually learn to not try to control things? Where it's like, okay, uh, I'm fearful, so I'm going to control. No, how, how do we release that? Number two, how do we trust the Holy Spirit? and enter into a post-Pentecost discipleship model where I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to get people to depend on me. I'm trying to help people depend on Jesus. I'm now in a partnership with the Holy Spirit facilitating hunger and big decisions and major moments of people's lives and pointing them to Jesus the entire time. Wow. So that's the role of the Holy Spirit in discipleship. I think, that's, I think that's happening right now in a fresh way. I pray that the virus would end tonight but I also pray that God, regardless of when this ends or how long this happens, I pray that you would continue to unite us as a church and help us come into a model where we're not dependent anymore on leaders. We don't need to fully just, okay, when Mark's around, I feel good and everything's happy. That's called codependency. Help us to be dependent mm -hmm. on you, Lord Jesus. Help us to come to you with everything. Help us to come with you with all of our needs. And while we do that, we do it in community. So that's my, that's my word for you as youth pastors to take advantage of this season, uh, to not try to overthink it, to not try to over control, but try to come into a new and simple trust with the Holy Spirit. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, thanks, Alex. Actually, we, we you kind of see this all through the scriptures, don't we? That uh, uh, unless the Holy Spirit shows up, you really can... Uh, change people's lives and that was my goal as a youth pastor is that I wanted young people to have an experience with Jesus and once they had that encounter with the Holy Spirit um, they were changed forever because they, that was an, an altar experience with them where they can go back and say God met me here God God got a hold of me here They're, they weren't coming because they you know on their mom and dad's faith or their grandparents faith they were coming because God uh, they had an encounter with Jesus Christ, and you guys know that. That's why we do camps. That's why we do uh, retreats and conferences, because we want to make a place where kids can have an experience with the Holy Spirit, because it will change them forever and get them through these tough times that we're facing now. So that's a great, great word, Alex. Um, we're going to um, go into a little time of roundtable here in a minute, but Alex, did you have a couple um, thoughts or questions that you just wanted to uh, give these guys as we're ready to uh, getting into the round tables um, and then the guys can be thinking about them uh, when we take this little commercial break here in a second but go ahead Alex. Yeah I, I think just two questions based on what I was uh, sharing. One is about that fear and control. I, I just want to ask you as a leader um, are there areas that you're fearful of with your students that you're tending to want to try to control situations or maybe it's actually making you step back I think fear has a polarizing thing. It can either make you overstimulate and overengage, or it can actually make you disconnect and be like, yeah, there's no hope, you know, whatever. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna back off. So do you feel that fear is kind of messing with your rhythms right now? And if so, what would that be? You know, this is, this is a safe place. This is uh, us on this Zoom call right here. No one else is gonna see what you're gonna share. So honestly, if you wanna even just have a moment to think and put that in the chat, 
Um, just like, you know what, I think for me and fear, this is really what I'm, I'm mainly fearful of for my kids, for, for church, for my job, whatever it is. And on the other side, um, what's a new level of trusting the Holy Spirit that you can enter into tonight? What's something that, that you're grappling with or, or something in that post-Pentecost fully dependent on the Holy Spirit? We're going to do our work. We're going to make calls. We're going to do meetings. We're going to continue to do things like this, but really trusting the Holy Spirit. What's a new level um, or a new way that we can actually come into a new partnership with the Holy Spirit when it comes to the discipleship of our students, the, the future of our youth groups and what that looks like, and uh, even just the future in general. Looking at 2020, it's like, I don't, I don't know when we're going to be able to come back together again as a youth group, but what's something that we could declare that we could come into a new level of trust and working with him? So those would be my two questions. Just go ahead and put some thoughts down there in the chat box. Uh, I do want to do a quick shout out to all the people on Facebook Live. We are running this simultaneously with um, uh, Facebook Live. So if there's anybody on there, Debbie's kind of monitoring that and communicating to people. Um, and uh, just want to say hi. Thanks for joining us on Facebook Live. Um, and so you guys are all superstars now. You're on, you're on Facebook Live, and everybody sees your face. So if you're wanted by the law, I'm sorry, you're you're fine. Hey, Mark, just a question: Are we doing yeah. this on IG Live or no? What, what's IG Live? <laughs> it's Instagram Live. I learned that last week. Yes, my wisdom is coming forth in my my beard. So uh, I'm just going to have uh, Debbie just uh, share a couple things that are coming up here real soon. Uh, just a real quick commercial as you're writing some things down. But I really want to encourage you. Uh, we don't want to be talking heads here. I want, I want you to, to um, either jump in with a question or write something down here. I want to hear from you um, and, and uh, do everything that you're asking your youth or your kids to do when you're asking them a question. So respond and let's get some conversation going. So Debbie, do your thing, girl. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Um, so oh, one second here. All right, so like Mark said, we just wanted to keep you all updated on some EF events happening online. So first off, Carol Ball is hosting a 15-minute weekly prayer session on Fridays at 11 a.m. This time is focused on connecting through prayer during the season of isolation. You can join us by heading to our Elam Fellowship Facebook page and watching the live stream. Oh. And next, we also have two live webinars on crisis management coming up on April 6th and 13th at 11 a.m. Rich Gross will be sharing about crisis management for the servant leader, and John Schiffert will share on financial uncertainty during uncertain times. You can find the link to sign up in the comments. We'd love for you to join us. And that's it, now we'll head back to the huddle. Thanks, Debbie, appreciate that. Um, so there's some things there. If you're available tomorrow morning at 11, um, we open it up to anybody who wants to get on and just pray. Carol's going to be leading that. Um, in the future, there's going to be some other people leading that as well. But uh, just uh, a lot of people are praying right now. It's really cool to see on, on uh, some of these Facebook posts, uh, people just worshiping uh, on rooftops, um, all these uh, uh, workers in the hospital and nurses and just crying out to God and just uh, it's just really a cool move of God happening and so um, just uh, it's just in a scary time it's fun to see uh, that the Holy Spirit isn't uh, all panicky and he, he kind of knows what's going on and he's going to use it um, so um, thanks for putting stuff in the chat there none of you did it so you're all fired from your jobs uh, anything with um uh, Alex's word there uh, you want to talk about uh, feel free just to unmute yourself and go right in it um, you know I could start off with some questions but if, if somebody has a question just uh, or a thought uh, just go ahead and um, share it real quick I know there's some good stuff there um, anything concerning you about your kids in ministry how many times are you connecting are you connecting what are some of the challenges um, out there Again, you guys are so quiet. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, um, so I, I, no, I think what Alex is saying is like pretty huge. Like from a leader's perspective, um, f for myself, especially like oftentimes I find like that I can complicate things too, too much and I can like just think too much into it and whatnot. Um, but we're, we're quite, like, quite physically like 
we're all being limited to what we're capable of. And it's almost like dumbing down what we should be doing. Um, so I think, no, I think that was a powerful word. And it just, I think it's, it's a really powerful time to just um, get thinking about how we do ministry um, and almost reevaluate, hey, are we doing this for the right reasons? Or, you know, for myself even, like, am I, are we, are we, what, what does the relationship with, between the students and Christ look like right now um, in my youth group? And what can I do to change that? Um, whether it be, hey, when we get out of this thing, youth group's going to look different or whatever the case may be, like, hey, you know, this is a time to reevaluate. Are we doing what needs to be done? Um, cause it is simple and it is, it is, it's not complicated, but we just, we tend to complicate it more than it needs to be. And I think Alex's message was just so pure and like spot on. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. We can seem to overthink things and, uh, hit the panic button and things can just kind of snowball from there. Um, have you gotten any questions from your students? Uh, you know, uh, what's going on with this? Where's God in all this? Uh, you know, what's what's he doing in all this? Uh, anything that you kind of face in there? Um, as you're thinking about that, Pastor Brian, you, you wrote down a, a question there. You want to go ahead and, and voice that? Uh, it was it was really a comment because I've been on a, quite a few of these uh kind of Zoom meetings lately, and fear is just one of those things that just keeps coming up, you know, like how do you, as a, uh, a leader and how, as, a, as um, in a church, how do you overcome fear? And to me, it's always been this issue of surrender. You, you're literally having to lay down the fear and pick up the faith, you know, so like in every circumstance right now, and I, I don't know how things are up in New York, but here in North Carolina, we've hit like crazy pollen season, which means like we get tickles in our throats, our nose starts running. And you know, when you got a virus going around every few seconds, your anxiety level like goes through the roof because you're like, is it pollen or is it the virus? Is it pollen or is it the virus? And so it's real easy to get caught in this like trap of fear. Like, you know, I, I can't, I'm just, I'm not going to do anything. I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to you know, I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to be around, I, you know, just whatever it is. So you, you get caught up in this fear and it really paralyzes you. Like you, you just stop doing anything. You know, um, Alex was talking about the, the kind of the two different sides of it. Some people want to control everything when they feel fear. But for me personally, I tend to try and back up and not do anything. I get more paralyzed by fear than anything. So for me, it's an act of surrender to say, you know what? I'm just going to keep pushing forward, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. I'm just going to keep pushing forward. That's good. So it was a good word. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, fear, fear can be very crippling um, in all this. I, we, we, we're battled with the, the pollens. I don't know if it's pollen or what's going on up here, but my wife, she has really bad allergies, seasonal allergies, and my oldest son, and they're both sniffling and sneezing. And my oldest, the 14-year-old, he's like, do I have the virus? Do I have the virus? And uh, you know, it's a, we we just got to come against uh, allergy season because that's <laughs> that's, bad too. Um, that's right. I know Bill and Mel kind of have a, a question here about, um, and this is a really good one. Worries about uh, the environment that their kids live in. Uh, I remember as a youth pastor, uh, I used to hate having a really. Well, I'd, I we'd have a really good meeting, and then I'd be fearful because we have to send them home and uh, into an environment uh, and and that kind of deals with this whole issue here that we can't control the whole thing. Um, but there, uh, uh, they mentioned there that um, I'm concerned about exactly what Alex mentioned. It seems like kids are in small groups or codependent on the, both of them as leaders. Um, anything you want to speak to that, Alex, or anybody else? Um, it, it's, it's hard, I mean, because uh, we feel that we feel them, uh, you know, just coming off of us and having to be there. Uh, uh, it's almost like a marriage relationship sometime. Uh, and it's just, uh, you know, how do you break that? How do you uh, let the Holy Spirit come in? Um, have you guys had any breakthrough with that, Mel? Or is it uh, just uh, something that you're still, uh, oh, you want, <laughs> she's pointing to Brian. <laughs> or she's pointing to you, Bill. She's pointing to you. <laughs> That's what MJ does. He dishes it off. 
passes it. Yeah, no, Bill could speak to that more than me. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were the extrovert. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it, I've been involved in camp with uh, Mel's dad um, for like 10 years. And every year we seem to have a lot of kids, you know, they come to the altar, they they would drop their sins at the altar. And then the next year it's the exact same thing over and over again. Sure, sure. And, and it's that, it's that, it's that m movement you have at camp during that week. Our camp is only a week. And then, and then they go home to their home lives. And, and I'm starting to see that in our, in our youth group at our church, that they, some of them will participate at group and they, they're, um, they don't participate like wholeheartedly, but, you can see that they're starting to, to get it a little bit and then they go home and we try to connect with them almost every day via text or whatever to try to keep them connected. And uh, it's like they just lose all steam when they're not with us. It's, uh, it gets frustrating sometimes. So that's, that's like one of my major concerns with them. Well, it's, it's like being a parent. Uh, the younger the kid is, the more dependent they are on you as a parent. But as they grow and mature, um, they get more independent uh, and things like that. And that's, that's what we're dealing with with some of your, your students is that they're so young in the Lord uh, that uh, they really need, um, you know, some of this handholding and walking along. But there comes a day where they have to choose to try to grow up here in the spirit and, and to uh, give the, their life over to the call of God on their life. I mean, what Alex was talking about, you know, what happened to Peter? What happened to the disciples? What happened to Esther in the Old Testament um, that took a frail little girl from, uh, you know, insecurities, woundedness, uh, very much an introvert to someone who boldly goes in front of the king and saves the nation? It, it, that's, that's, some, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, same thing with Peter. You know, he denies himself in front of a 12-year-old girl, but then preaches the, the most uh, amazing sermon and 3,000 get saved in one day. I mean, it's just the Holy Spirit has to do that kind of thing. And so we just got to kind of keep pointing um, our young people towards the Holy Spirit um, and uh, challenging them uh, that they can do this. I, I think, honestly, I think coaching could really work in this situation here. I think if, if you, uh, and, and if anybody's been a part of coaching, coaching is asking a lot of questions and, uh, having them find out the answers for themselves as they seek the uh, seek the Lord on it and and any interaction that you have with your students if you can kind of coach them throw the ball back in their corner uh and trying to um because they have to grow up quick uh, they have to grow up quick in this situation that's happening now uh there's a lot of fear um but uh, fear looks backward uh, faith looks forward um and, and that's that's a big challenge in some of this any other thoughts out there guys Alex, anything you want to add to? Go ahead, Kyrell. Where is Oleg? Uh, he's running around somewhere upstairs. He's here somewhere. <laughs> um, one thing I want, it actually, it's the same thing that Bill uh, was talking about, uh, um, something that I was dealing with, um, and uh, something that I actually read about yesterday in my devotional, um, in my studies, and I just wanted to share this verse with you guys, is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Um, and seven, uh, Paul was talking, um, he's saying, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has make, been making it grow. And that's something to like, um, for me, um, it comes to like rely on the Holy Spirit that we could like stress and think like, hey, um, you know, what are the kids doing at home? Like, how are they, are they, are they taking the advice that, um, that we're giving them to spend time with God? Like we could, we could just make this like, almost like something that we're continuing to stress about every day. But it's the Holy Spirit um, that grows that seed that we plant in them. Like it's our job to tell them and then the Holy Spirit does the rest of the work. Um, and that's ex basically what Alex was talking about of trusting the Holy Spirit to do his work. Um, and I don't know if that encouraged anyone, but um, you know, God's got it and the Holy Spirit is working in them, even if we don't see or um, necessarily maybe hear. Cause I know like teens, uh, they don't really open up to us as much. Um, I guess, as maybe uh, the youth do, but um, I believe and I trust that the Holy Spirit is doing the work um, yeah. in them. Mark, that would be my, that would be my main uh, push here. When you talk specifics, um, principles, like 
major principles that you say work for everyone, it, they don't work for everybody. Every kid, every home, every single parent, every, every situation is completely different. But that's the main thing that, that when, it, when, when I talk about a, a post-Pentecost, helping them become dependent on Jesus, that's one half of the equation is how do we actually do that? The other half is then us as leader, how do we trust the Holy Spirit? Because what I find is when I, I put pressure on myself for the chaos that I can't even control. So I, I start to beat myself up for, we just did this conference, we did this thing and their home life and all that. I start to beat myself up and now I'm bearing weight and pressure that I, is not mine to bear. And then when you bear weight and pressure, you can't help but then try to control the things that you're not supposed to control. So now all of a sudden you're trapped in this cycle where you're like, these kids' home lives are crazy, they're not doing well, I need to come back in. And so now you're trapped in the cycle of building dependence, not disciples. And that's what Jesus told us to do, to make disciples. And so uh, really the challenge for me right now is not trying to get into the details of stuff, but that trust game between us and the Holy Spirit. Can we take all of those burdens and just throw them at his feet? Can we enter into a new level of trust? When you do that, now, now you're a leader who's bearing responsibility. It's called a great commission, not just a great mission. The great commission means that we're bearing weight with Christ and the Holy Spirit and our Father to bring the gospel to the world. And so this is a radical call. Cairo, what you're saying is true. It's a radical trust of, can I trust the Holy Spirit with my kids, even in the midst of chaos? Can I actually do that? That might not free them. But I'm telling you what, friend, it's going to free you. And then you're going to be able to have more energy. When, when things hit the fan, you're going to be able to jump into it. So it, it doesn't distance you from the problem. It doesn't solve the problem, but it actually frees you as a leader. How many of you would just honestly raise your hand and just say, that uh, I'm in that spot right now. I just really need to trust the Lord with this situation. This is uh, different than I've ever, uh, you know, I haven't learned in Bible school or got on a webinar. I just really need to learn how to, uh, as Kay Maria puts down there in her comment there, let, let go and let God. Um, it's easier said than done, uh, but it's, it's a, a good word uh, to live on there. And uh, we just really need to be able to, to trust him in this process and what he's doing and get the, it takes the pressure off. And then we can hear really cool God stories of what's going on. Um, are there any wins out there? Anything that you're coming across with your students that was like, man, God is moving. This is some really good stuff going on. Any, any, uh, anything we can celebrate with you that you want to share? We're going to be wrapping up here in a few minutes, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I, know I have a, go ahead, I have a win actually. Um, so my, my youth group is, I love my kids because I don't have the problem of, you know, them just like kind of staring at me and, and crickets and things. My kids are so active and so vocal and want to tell me every story that relates to every point that I'm making in the lesson. And um, I love how engaging they are. And so when we do our Zoom chats, um, my concern, as I expressed last week, was how can I get them all connected? Because mm -hmm. I have some kids that um, don't have the technology at home. Um, to connect with us. And so I prayed, you know, I said, God, you know, can you just make this happen? Can you just make the, the impossible happen? Um, and I was able to have all my kids on Zoom um, last week. And it was so awesome and um, encouraging because there was nothing I could do. I was pounding the pavement. I was calling, texting, everything. And in my strength, I couldn't do it. And I just had to sit down and say, God, if it's your will, let this happen. Don't let anybody slip mm -hmm. through the cracks and um once i surrendered it to the lord boom hey we're gonna connect i was able to connect with my aunt i was able to go to my grandma's house or whatever and um everybody was able to be on the call and my kids have actually um taken initiative um to um even like pray on their own with each other um and i encourage them to do that but you know you can encourage all day and you, the kids don't listen, but um, I've actually had a couple of my kids contact me and tell me, hey, I've been um, meeting with such and such, and we've been praying, and, and I'm talking about scriptures together, and I'm like, oh my, like, I, I purposely didn't assign partners. I purposely didn't give an assignment. I just said, take initiative, guys. 
You've got to own this yourselves. You can't ride on your parents' coattails. You've got to know Jesus for yourself, awesome. you know, in this time. And so to see actual fruit coming, you know, from that um, was very, very encouraging. And it was, you know, as Alex said, as soon as I released it to the Lord, because you can't be with them 24 seven, you can't see everything they're doing. Um, and I know, I, I just think about what was I like as a teenager? My parents, you know, are pastors and that didn't mean anything. You know, I had to know Jesus for myself and it wasn't until I did that growth and change and initiative started happening, you know, in my life. And so it's been really awesome to see that. Awesome. Great testimony. Thank you for sharing that, Sharice. Anybody else have a win? Uh, love to celebrate what God is doing. Because I think revival is going to break out with our young people. I really do. And uh, when we get out of this thing, I think the, the our, our young people are going to be spearheading out of this revival. Nick, go ahead, bud. Yeah, this is uh, kind of a small thing, but I think it's really uh really going to prove to be really influential in in our ministry is I feel like um, in the last couple of weeks of, of online meetings that we've had, we've had better connection, more conversation, more good conversation between leaders and students and students who wouldn't necessarily talk to each other on a normal in-person meeting. You know, they're just going to stay with their friends, but now everybody's together and communicating together and connecting together and and everyone's sitting in their homes so they're comfortable and you kind of get to see each other in that kind of comfortable environment and uh it's been a really good it's almost counterintuitive to think that you'd have the best kind of connections online via video but it's been really good for us in that sense that's cool that's cool my uh my wife she uh she's a She's got her master's in special ed, and she's a special ed teacher for fourth and fifth grades in one of our bigger uh, public schools in Pittsburgh. And um, they've been wanting her to do Zoom meetings. Well, not just her, but all the teachers. And um, with hers, it's a little bit different because she she can't have a Zoom meeting with all of her kids because some have Tourette's, some have, uh, you know, different uh, other um uh, things going on that you can't have a group especially in zoom so she has to meet with them individually one-on-one -on -one. so she she had her first one today uh, and she was super nervous about it and um, by the time she got off it she came out and she was literally in tears um, because of how special it was uh, the breakthrough that she had with this young student um, things that she was seeing in the classroom but just kind of wondering what was happening but now on a one-on-one -on -one thing got to got to actually see the breakthrough um you know we might not call that a move of the holy spirit but i think it is uh where i think uh, god is able to do something different um in a way that we might not have been ready for but uh just that little testimony there of what um, god's even doing in the public school through people that just want to connect and the power that is in connection even you know this as awkward as it can be sometimes there's connections that uh, we're making that we wouldn't have normally made um you know a lot of you i know uh, some i know better than others but we're we're building relationship here and i think it's going to be powerful in the days to come any other thoughts or questions as we uh, get ready to wrap up i'm going to have alex pray for us at the end and debbie has just a uh just a couple more uh, announcements real quick on uh, some things that are coming up but i don't want to cut anybody off no you got rid of your cat was that your cat that walked across you i, I looked up in time i looked up in time to see you and the cat was coming across your mouth yeah, yeah I, i'll say something real quick it doesn't have to do with youth group but I'm out of work right now. We I work for oral surgeons, and so we are seeing emergencies only, and they're taking, you know, one team one week. So I already did my week, and now I'll be technically unemployed for the next several weeks. But my practice administrator asked me to each morning put out an encouraging message, you know, and so I've been putting out basically a devotional with scripture and yes. talking about God. They're, none of them are saved, so they're getting the gospel, and, it's, yes. and I, then I also put a little... Uh, song, a song at the end and um, the responses have been awesome and I'm just grateful to be able to share the gospel <laughs> with my coworkers, and to see a lot of them responding in a positive way that's so awesome. that's been that's been awesome 
Yeah, I've seen a couple of those on on uh, Facebook there, and they're they're really good. Mel, you're doing a great job with that. Uh, we're we're um, the thing with with Esther in, in the Old Testament there is that when she gave herself over to the the call of God there, wasn't it cool that he downloaded uh, the Holy Spirit? That God just downloaded some things to this young girl that just set up Haman and. Uh, save the nation and just some of the creativity he's releasing to you guys in such a time as, as this, I guess you could say, where um, I'm just asking when I'm praying for you guys, I'm asking for new creative ideas coming through to connect and relate. And, and I think the Lord, uh, the final, the one thing the Lord has been telling me is that, you know, keep it simple, stupid, that whole kiss analogy there. Um, they just want you to reach out. They just want you to connect, and they might not give you the feedback. You guys know this. They might not. They might look at you like you, uh, uh, you know, like you're just deer in the headlights. But there's something going on in the inside. If we just keep connecting and reaching out, um, things are being planted there that uh, the Holy Spirit's going to breathe on. So uh, keep the creativity going. Any other last thoughts um, here before we we take off? I, I don't want to. Um, kick into too much of your evening is this are these the last two huddles been good for you guys have been encouraging um next uh, we won't be meeting next week um but we'll be meeting in two weeks and then two weeks after that and then uh hopefully we'll keep it up in may as well as long as the interest is there and uh, you find it helpful um we can go for that i just want to give one last chance for anybody to share a thought i, I do appreciate you all being on and then i'm going to have uh, Debbie, get on and, and give us uh, an update on some things and have Alex pray for us. Any last thoughts? We all good? All right, Debbie, um, uh, just share with us a couple of the uh, huddles that are coming up here. All right. Um, sorry, one second. This takes over my screen, so I've got to get out of here. Okay, so we've got two huddles coming up that we'd love for you guys to be a part of. On April 7th at 2 p.m., Carol Ball and Jody Seidler are hosting a session on women in ministry. They'll start off with a time of teaching and then discuss any questions that people have. And also, we'd love for both men and women to join us for this. And then on April 10th at 2 p.m., we have a huddle with Rob Horner about managing anxiety during uncertainty. And you can find the registration links for these huddles on our social media pages. Cool, thanks Debbie. Yeah, especially, I mean, both of those huddles are good, but I, I talked with Rob the other day. Uh, he's a, a Christian counselor, uh, Dr. Rob is what we call him. And um, he's really uh, excited about um, talking about this thing because everybody you talk to are dealing with some sort of anxiety and it all shows in different ways. So if you can make that one, um, I'm sure you'll find it helpful. Even get your kids on it. Um, this is for all ages here um, to uh, be a part of and things like that. So uh, thanks for coming on board. Um, I, I do want you to, if I know some of you are, um, are churches are struggling maybe financially, if you can let your pastor know, and Bill, you might already know about this, the CARE Act, that the, the stimulus package that the government is put out there there's um, over three billion dollars to uh s small businesses and churches 501 uh, 503 um, um nonprofit organizations and churches that can help out um, but you gotta get your pastor or your their accounting uh person on it i think if you go to our ef um, um facebook page there's information on there um, Luke, do you know, uh, is there a link to that? Um, is there is something on our page? I know I'm catching you off guard with this, but um, th this could cover some of your uh, salaries and uh, payroll and things like that. Um, if you have a question and there's nothing on that page, uh, call the office here um, and ask for Chris Lideline. Uh, he's been kind of spearheading this, um, you know, but there's, there are things out there, but that you have to get rolling on it quick. Um, that are just specifically for churches uh, that can help ease the burden financially. Um, praying that God meets all your needs. I really appreciate you guys being here. Uh, so great that you, that you can make it. Uh, thanks for giving up an hour or so of your time. Um, feel free to, to contact me. I've texted a lot of you. Uh, you have my number. Um, the email you can get as well on um, 
or, or contact Debbie through our Facebook pages there. If you haven't been on our Facebook pages, go ahead and be, get on there so we can connect there as well. But I'm just going to have Alex uh, Prague. He's got to take off. He's got another Zoom uh, meeting um, coming up here down the pike. So you got time to pray for us, Alex? Always time for prayer, brother. Let's close our eyes right now. Thank you. Lord, what this next season looks like is not as leaders, how much can we do for our kids while that's still important. But it's really the question before us is, over this next season, how can we trust you in a fresh way? Because it's a trust game at the end of the day. And if how much we put in our court, that actually shows the level of trust that we have with you. So right now, I just pray that you would lead us on a faith journey, that all of us on this phone call, all of us that are going to watch this on Facebook Live, youth pastors and lead pastors and kids ministers and just Lord, this whole, this whole area of leadership that I just pray for a deep dive in a new level of trust with you, God, that we wouldn't add more to our shoulders. That's just going to bury us. But right now we actually come to you. You said to us to bring all of our cares to you. Why? Because you care for us. Mm -hmm. So right now I just encourage everybody right on this phone call. If you're listening to my voice, Bring your cares to him. Cast it. Don't try to sort it out. Yeah. Don't try to figure it out. The Bible also says that he gives us peace that surpasses our understanding. That means that you can't actually figure out, why do I have so much peace right now? Let me journal and figure it out. No, you can't because it's something that he gives us. So we come and we bring our cares before you. We bring our fears. We bring our doubts. We bring our own troubles. God, if we've lost our job, if things are on the fence with like, okay, we are the youth leader now, but I'm not sure if this thing goes more, what's going to happen or God, we bring all of that to you because you care for us. We throw it at your feet. They're not ours to carry. And Lord, I ask that you would lead us now in a beautiful trust walk with you, that we can actually trust you more and more each day for our own lives. But God, also the youth ministries, the kids ministries, the things that we oversee, you are the great discipler. And we declare it tonight as we close that you are the great discipler. You will teach them all things. You will lead them and guide them in all truth. Yes, you've entrusted us for this season. We call them our kids. Like you've given them to us. But right now, Abba, we give them back to you. Right now, we lift them up to you in all the things that would actually be, be, be unhealthily tying them to us and limiting their dependence on you. Just come right now in a beautiful way and, and lead us, guide us. Just as we're entrusting our kids to be led by you, we're also right now, as Elam leaders, entrusting these youth pastors and youth leaders and youth directors to you, that you are going to lead them in every single step that they need to take moving forward. God, thank you for the stories of unity we're hearing tonight. Hey, my kids feel connected more than ever. Hey, we're having more dialogue than we've ever had. God, we just speak unity in a fresh way. We speak community and we speak a fresh trust to walk in you. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're with us every step of the way. 24-7, 365, you have our back and you're helping us love Jesus more. You're helping us come into relationship with the Father and you're working together as a trinity. You're working together to help us actually lead in an awesome way. So thank you for tonight. We speak blessing a great sleep. And Lord, any burden right now, I just pray that even as we go to bed, we would just continue to give those to you. We'd wake up feeling refreshed, vivacious, ready to go, clarity in a fresh way. So God, thank you for this call. We love you so much. We love Mark, the Godfather of youth ministry. We pray blessings over him right now. We speak prosperity. We speak health. We speak blessings over his family and for him and his ministry. Thank you for tonight. You're going to pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. See you in a couple weeks. I can't wait to hear some great stories of what God's doing with your groups. God bless you.